Good afternoon and welcome uh, to everyone. Uh, we are now at the 20th episode of this uh, bi-weekly updates and the bi-weekly updates started uh, soon after the coup one year ago. So one year yesterday we commemorated the, the coup and uh, celebrated the resilience of the people of Myanmar that still are very compact and with a day of silent, silent strike, they showed how united they are in opposing uh, the atrocity and the violence of uh, the current military uh, regime. And uh, with that, so I think today we will have quite a lot to say, uh, looking back uh, to the past, to the recent past, but also what has happened uh, yesterday and what are the prospects for uh, the future. We have with us Debbie Stoddard. Again, she doesn't need any introduction. She is uh, well known and uh, quite popular in our followers. Uh, she's an activist, uh, human rights, focusing on human rights in uh, Myanmar as well as in Southeast. Uh, Asia, and she is also a leading ASEAN uh, Burma, uh, an organization that has always been very solid there with what is happening in Myanmar through the last decade. So please, Debbie, as usual, uh, we will have about 20 minutes of presentation and then open the floor for question and answer here on Zoom and also on Facebook. Thank you, Leah, and welcome, everybody. I know we're going to have a small group of uh, people on Zoom today because the past uh, few days has been full of online webinars and meetings and activism to mark one year since this military uh, junta tried to grab power in, in a coup that, we would, that I've been calling a tragic failure tragic for the people of Burma and a failure for this military junta. In, um, and I just wanted to do a little bit of a wrap up when we, you know, when the coup happened. So when, when 1st of February happened, what were we doing and what were we thinking? Well, the, you know, in the weekend leading up to the event, uh, there was already a lot of speculation uh, you know, there was news coverage saying that the military had hinted that they are not averse to a coup because of uh, because they had taken a strat strategy out of Trump's book playbook and alleged all kinds of widespread voter fraud in order to deny the landslide victory of the National League for Democracy in the November 2020 election. So if there was this hint that there might be a coup. And then people in the other military leaders said, of course, we're not going to have a coup. And then the coup happened. But what happened after that? Well, ASEAN was slightly muted, of course. They said, oh, it's a bad thing and uh, restore, restore order, restore democracy. But um, they were actually very, they actually dragged their feet on any type of coordinated or decisive response. And it took uh, until April the 24th. So we're looking at, uh, um, you know, this is February, March, right? So it took more than two and a half months for ASEAN to actually get its act together. And then they came up with this five-point consensus, which um, uh, Min Aung who was at the meeting, seemed to agree to. And within a month of the five-point consensus, um, increased the number of conflict incidents by 200, which, we, which meant that instead of reducing the violence as demanded by the five-point consensus, Main online within a month of the five point consensus actually escalated conflict by 30% across the country. In fact, I think uh, some of you may have seen a fact sheet that was released uh, early last year, um, soon after the uh, five point consensus was adopted, where within two weeks of the five point consensus, there were actually 65 uh, airstrikes, 65 incidents in which planes dropped bombs on 
civilians in Kachin and Karen State. For Karen State, it was the first time, um, you know, during in the past year, the, the kind of airstrikes we've seen in Eastern Burma, um, we hadn't seen before for many decades, for several, for at least two decades, there hadn't been airstrikes in Karen State. And now today, it has become routine that the sound of planes are something that um, is, is, it strikes fear into people. In fact, what people are saying is, we can run away from artillery airstrikes. The PDF and the ethnic armed organizations have ways of dealing with ground troops, but everyone feels defenseless against the airstrikes, which is also somewhat surprising given that um, due in, the, in the past few weeks, we saw a few um, changes in the military. The uh, Min Aung line that uh, junta leader um, tried to consolidate his hold on the regime, and he actually removed the Air Force Chief, General Mo Mong Cho, and the Judge Advocate General, Lieutenant General Ong Din Dwe from their posts. And while nobody knows why, exactly why, we understand that, you know, uh, Min Aung Lang wanted to fully control the Air Force because the junta is now over relying on Air Force airstrikes and drone strikes and attack, and attack uh, helicopters to try and subdue the population. So what was the readout at that time when the coup happened? Well, First, people were saying, oh, you know, there was an assumption that uh, there will be a little bit of unhappiness, but uh, people will fall in line with the military junta and cooperate with the junta, even though they were not happy about it, in order to try and achieve some type of stability and normalization. Well, that didn't happen. Um, there was widespread protests, a lot of them led by um, workers, uh, labor, labor activists, by women, by youth, um, all around the country. And when you saw the heat map of the number of protests that were taking place, even oldies like me and my contemporaries who were part of the uh, friends from Burma who were part of the 8888 generation, the last big uprising against a military junta in Burma, agreed that this was more widespread and sustained. The level of protests in the country was more widespread and sustained than the 8888 uprising. So um, what we started to see on the other side, the naysayers were just saying, well, the military will do a mass arrest and kill off a few people, and then the um, uh, resistance will dissipate. Um, but we didn't see that. We ended up seeing um, what amounts to the most sustained and systematic and widespread level of resistance, both in armed struggle and in nonviolent activism. We saw young people being extremely uh, creative and resourceful. Um, um, f going out on the streets and when they were being killed and attacked in the streets, they started to revert to more creative ways, including silent strikes. And whole of Burma yesterday to mark 1st of February 2022 was, went through a six hour silent strike followed by a clapping strike. And we could see on social media, the evidence all around the country, footage of of empty streets, photos of empty, empty villages, people staying off the road, staying, even though shops were being penalized, people were being arrested for closing their shop on 1st of February. Some, some shopkeepers even just sold one item. They just put one item uh, for display for sale and not the rest of their merchandise to show that um, they were indeed keeping the shop open, but their intention was to basically support the silent strike. So we've seen that. We saw, we still see people banging their pots and pans in the evening. We still see people, even people facing bombings and airstrikes, staying at home and joining 
um, uh, protests, showing their solidarity by doing protest selfies. Even military families have been anonymously posting um, their pictures of resistance. So we that's one side of the picture. The other side is the political changes that have happened. You know, Itin Zamao and, and Esther Zena and all of those uh, young women leaders who were previously pre-coup were vilified for standing in solidarity with the Rohingya, for denouncing genocide and, and institutionalized discrimination in the country were the ones who became leaders, were some of the high profile leaders of this protest movement. And that also um, helped create a very fundamental political shift in the way um, politics was seen by young people. You know, I worked, I'm a Malaysian, I've worked to support human rights and democracy in Burma for 33 years. And I can tell you one thing that is very, very clear in Burmese culture, and I mean, not just Burman culture, but a lot of the other ethnic cultures is that you do not apologize publicly, especially if you're in a position of dominance or you're in the mainstream. But what we saw was young people and older people inspired by them actually publicly apologizing for their denial, for the mistreatment of the Rohingya. We started to see more and more people willing to use the R word, the Rohingya, and acknowledge them as part of their movement. But also what was exciting was that we started to also see that we uh, that we, uh, the LGBTQ community, the LGBT plus community, instead of being vilified and made fun of, were warmly welcomed, not just in Rangoon and Mandalay, but other smaller towns and, and, and cities uh, joining the protest movement in drag, in full regalia, and still being embraced as part of the movement. Now, a lot of people ask me, where were the monks during this time? Because there's this whole um, assumption that people in Burma cannot be active without the leadership of the monks, of activist monks. Well, you know, in some ways, it was not a bad thing that the monks did not take, that took a backseat because it allowed women's leadership to, uh, to emerge and to assert itself. And this became very handy. I think many of you understand that um, in uh, mainstream uh, Burmese Buddhism, uh, what a woman wears below her waist, a tamain or a, a Burmese sarong is considered spiritually unclean. And the women um, use this to, to protect their communities. What they started to do was to hang their longis the termains, uh, the termains, the sarongs on strings across the street. And um, that made the military and the police, all these Orthodox people, very superstitious. They would have to stop their trucks and get some one of the lower ranking guys in, the, in their group to go and get a pole and pull down the, the dislodge the women's sarong before they can proceed. And that bought a lot of time and protection for people who were trying to run away from the violence after they were protesting. So we could see that um, very interesting ways in which uh, women and young people used what was socially and spiritually taboo in the in culturally taboo in the society to, uh, to weaponize it as part of their resistance. So, you know, it's, um, it's been, very inspiring, but it's also been very painful because, you know, a lot of us lost friends, um, people who were killed um, at various stages of the school because of deliberate violence, people who died in custody because of uh, um, they were prevented from having access to medical attention, and and people who um, are still in jail, people who were um, 
mistreated, abused, and tortured in well, during during their detention in interrogation centers and in um, prisons. You know, nearly twelve thousand people have been arrested within a year. This, for me, was un, for many of us was unimaginable. The largest number of political prisoners that we have on record in Burma, pre-coup was 3,000 back in 1990. That's more than 30 years ago. So to see this happening, especially at the time of the COVID pandemic, where um, being put in crowded, unsanitary conditions was is, 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 could essentially be a death sentence given the COVID pandemic, people were still resisting and people were still fighting back. Now, what happened during uh, the month of January? Well, during January, the military junta, in its desperate um, um, attempts to gain control of the country, um, was involved in 881 clashes or attacks on civilians. If we, if we look at the, the figures in January 2021, where a lot of the conflict incidents were taking place in Rakhine State back in uh, January 2021 in Rakhine State, in Karen State, in Shan and Kachin State, you know, and you look at that, that was, um, and you look at what happened in the last month in January, it was basically a 1,318% increase on conflict incidents. And in July, and sorry, in January, we saw that um, uh, the military really focused a lot of their violence on Eastern Burma, Karen and Kareni state. Um, and those poor folks in Kareni state are still suffering. In fact, nearly 60%, now 60, two thirds of the population of that one state have been displaced. Some people displaced multiple times because of attacks and violence, including airstrikes and attacks on their state capital. And then we also saw in on the e, on the west of the country in Sagai, yet more attacks and more people getting displaced. Junta airstrikes and artillery strikes were the way they were attacking people, and um, um, and what we and what we saw in Loiko, the capital of Kareni or Karyat Kaya State, is that um, uh, various. Um, Agencies estimate that between 50 to even 90 percent of the population of the state capital has been displaced. Many of them have tried to flee to um, to not to southern Shan State. And remember, I was talking about the fact that the junta was recalling veterans, retired people, and um, um, and training military wives and civilians and uh, family members of soldiers. Well, they've also started also training prison staff for com combat duty. And this is also a sign that um, what we are seeing is about to get worse if we don't see any significant movements within the UN Security Council. Uh, Leah, I'm gonna talk a little bit longer. I'm gonna be a little bit over time, so I hope you don't mind. Now, um, Let's go ahead. We, 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 you know, we've been using the AAPP figures, which is um, uh, estimated up to like a, a nearly 1,400 people killed by the junta, but these are actually mainly incidents in which people have been killed in protests or they were arrested, tortured, and, and, and murdered in custody. But we went through the ACLAT database and um, we estimate that at least 2,584 civilians, um, including uh, 200 children and about 150 women have been killed in Burma as a result of violence. So that means we, at this point, we haven't been able to uh, uh, work out, uh, to count up who was killed by Junta and, the, uh, and, and, and their militias and who was killed by the PDFs. But we know as a result of, of coup-related violence, um, about 2,584 people have died so far. 
Um, and, you know, uh, a couple of um, um, sessions ago, I talked about the crackdown on the NLD and, and other political parties. Well, the NLD announced that as of 1st of January, uh, 649 party members uh, had been arrested and 14 of them had died, been killed, either assassinated or died and killed in custody. So, you know, we, in the midst of all of this, we have another controversy, which was the interview published yesterday, broadcast yesterday with the new UN special envoy, uh, Nolene Hazer, Her Excellency Nolene Hazer, um, by Channel News Asia. Now, um, this uh, interview, and you can always look it up online, um, attracted a lot of um, uh, backlash and controversy uh, for a number of reasons. And, um, you know, yesterday, because of the highly charged emotional atmosphere in the movement of people who basically are dealing with one year of trauma and struggle and resistance, the ups and downs, looking back on what's happened this year, um, you know, this, um, this, the footage of this interview didn't go down very well. Um, the, UN, the, the UN Special Envoy uh, came in with good intentions, and I'm sure she meant um, she tried to be conciliatory and, and, and approach the interview with good intentions, but um, there are a couple of back, there was a, a quite a big backlash, and, 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 I'll and I'll tell you why. Well, she, she said that young people who are willing to die fighting for political transformation should negotiate what power sharing could look like over the long term. Now, it seems quite reasonable to say, hey, people, if you're willing to die for this, you should at least be willing to negotiate. Because negotiating is much easier than dying. But the, I think the, the, the problematic phrase in all this is power sharing. Now, power sharing is what got us into this ugly mess in the first place. Remember, and, and this power sharing is like a long saga, you know, it's like, a, 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 I remember um, back in the late 90s, this famous interview, which was actually published in The Nation, if I'm not mistaken, it was published in a Thai newspaper, where Aung San Suu Kyi did not rule out power sharing with the military for the good of the country. And um, uh, I remember that because um, I actually organized that interview. <laughs> and, um, and that power sharing interview ended up um, being used over and over again in various meetings, including high level meetings, to show that some kind of concil reconciliation and uh, um, political set, uh, settlement that was a win-win situation for everyone would uh, was possible. You know, power sharing for its own sake, as we learned quite bitterly from 2011 to 2021, is not uh, is probably more harmful because what we saw was a power sharing agreement which allowed the military to consolidate its power to enjoy more than a more than a 200 percent increase in national budget uh, defense budget within 10 years to increase their foreign exchange earnings to Myanmar Economic Holdings, Myanmar Economic Corporation, Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise, and all of these other um, so-called state-owned enterprises that were actually junta controlled. And the military did not have to give up anything. It was not power sharing. What we saw was a consolidation of military power without the military having to alter its behavior in any shape, way, or form. They were guaranteed effective veto power over constitutional amendments during that 10-year period 
of transition where, well, firstly, we all, uh, people in Burma got access to the internet, which was amazing, which was great. But also we saw a rise in conf uh, resource driven conflicts. We saw a new war breaking out in Kachin state. We saw the Rohingya genocide, all thanks to the military. And we saw constant flare ups around the country, constant uh, conflict. So to, and to see what we've seen in the past year, where the military junta has shown no mercy whatsoever, where we saw some of the most horrific atrocity crimes, including people being mutilated before they were returned to their families, you know, um, uh, where, where, where civilians have, who have been put in this position where they understand that if they don't fight back for their survival, they will be killed. There was no quarter given by the military. There was no compromise shown by Senior General Min Aung Lang's guys. How do you then consider the idea of power sharing after this 10 year experience of power sharing? It'd be, it, it, I think there was a little bit of a problem of understanding the experience. This is why the movement was transformed because young people said, oh, we're not talking about constitutional amendment. We're talking about trashing this 2008 constitution and bringing a new one, drafting a new one in, for an inclusive general federal union. We're not talking about, okay, let's forget all the shitty, horrible things you did to us and we'll forgive and forget and we'll give you a place in parliament and we'll give you a place in the government and we'll guarantee your economic well-being and your wealth if you let us, if you stop killing us. No, we already see that the appetite for accountability is very high. People in the movement know that, that the fundamental root of the corrupt, uh, brutal, um, uh, um, evil acts that have taken place, the genocide of the Rohingya, the atrocity crimes happening all around the country, it's military impunity and we need accountability. But I think what was a little bit strange about the special envoy statement was actually saying that we have to deal with the military because the military is in control at this particular time. Hello, if the military was in control at this particular time, why are they escalating attacks on civilians? Why have they escalated violence all around the country in their panic stricken desperation to kill as many people as possible so that they will give in? Why have they escalated the conflict to the point that conflict figures in Burma is more than Syria and Afghanistan combined? That is not the sign of a regime that is in control. Why do we see the Myanmar chat lose more than 50% of its value? Why has the price of rice gone up by 40% within the space of 10 months? That does not look like an economy under control. So I think if we were actually talking realistically about what's going on, the, the corporations leaving Burma have already told us, those oil giants leaving Burma have already sent the message, this is not the winning team. We are leaving a sinking ship. And we do not need ASEAN or ineffectual um, uh, UN efforts that do not actually pay attention or respect to the voice of people on the ground to the current generation of young leaders in terms of how to resolve this crisis. If we ignore them, we risk becoming public enemy, probably public enemy number three after Min Aung Lang and Hun Sen. So I think it's quite important as we go into the, the second year of this resistance that we make it the final year of resistance, that things have to turn around. We can, we, if we want to preserve and support this new wave of leadership in the country, we have to make sure 
that those who are fighting in the armed resistance uh, can return to civilian political life. And the longer they fight, the longer they use armed violence to resist this junta, is the harder it will be for the country to transform back into a civilian democracy. So sorry I ran over time, but that's my rant for today. Uh, it's uh, deserve a long rant because indeed after one year, I think, oh, sorry. After one year, I think you deserve uh, more space. And also today is uh, the last time that we are here with Debbie. And hopefully in the future we will see her come back. But for now we will take a break. So you deserve a longer time. We have already some questions. Uh, First, I am glad to see David uh, here and his question is, a real question is, which way the WA will decide to jump as they are the most effective military force aside from the army? And then in addition about the Kachin, friends are fighting even in remote region of the North. So, but what about the WA? Then from Anthony, uh, some of the media are comparing Myanmar with Syria, saying that the situation in Myanmar is evolving in a similar way. Since the military doesn't seem to be backing down, what mediator may have the respect of both sides in the conflict to establish a platform for resolving the crisis? Now, that is, of course, again, a mediator between the perpetrators and uh, the victim is not going an easy enterprise. Yes, please. Well, um, glad to see you, David, and glad to see you, John, and other people in the room. Thank you for joining. It's been a while, um, and and welcome back, Anthony. Um, the the uh, you know your your guess is as good as mine. Which way the war are going to jump? Um, the reality is that uh, the WA have been looking out for their own interests, um, and um, it's I, I haven't really been paying attention to some the orientation of some of these um, armed groups. So I, I am the last person you should ask. But the, since we talk about the WA and Kachin, one other development is the fact that China has seemed to have finally woken up. On the 28th of, of January, the uh, China's uh, representative to the UN Security Council impassioned, gave an impassioned statement um, uh, emphasizing the urgency of halting the violence in Myanmar. And China also sent a message to the Kachin uh, Independence Army to please, can you please, uh, you know, quieten down on our border area? Can you please uh, reduce, you know, stop uh, fighting on this on too close to us? And the Kachins obliged. So we can already start to see that China is finally having to admit that uh, the chaos, the anarchy in Burma, Myanmar, as a result of this coup is actually too much to bear. And um, I hope that the statement made by the Chinese representative to, to the Security Council sends a message that while China may not necessarily support um, a, a strong and decisive diplomatic interventions, including sanctions on Burma, it hopefully will not stand in the way or block any of these measures. So that's one thing that that uh, we need to understand. And you know, the WA is always the WA has always been seen to be more closely aligned to China's interests and their own interests than um, any part of the movement. But let's see how that um, how that emerges. And I hope that um, the next person doing the Burma update will be more authoritative on on um, on these armed groups than I uh, than I am. Now. Um, Given the fact that the conflict figures in Burma since September, for every month since September, is actually higher than Syria, it's not, um, it's not surprising that the media have actually um, started to look more closely um, and more seriously about what's going on in Burma. And if we are talking about mediation and a political settlement, well, 
power sharing is not going to hack it. We really need what would amount to accountability for those most responsible for atrocity crimes, and including um, this chap. What's his name? Oh, I have to call him up. Um, you know, uh, um, 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 Colonel Nine Bobo from Infantry Battalion 82, who organized the ramming attack in Rangoon that left five protesters dead on 5th of December was honored by Senior General Min Aung Lai for his outstanding performance under military rule and brave services and heroism. Okay, so that's one name that's supposed to be submitted to the ICC, I can tell you that. But um, what we need to see is there's no space at this time for negotiation. We're going to have to actually deploy much stronger leverage hit, hit, to hit the military where it hurts. And what is the military concerned about? It's concerned about foreign exchange revenues, especially the fact that we are probably going to see this junta, we see this junta facing a liquidity crisis. It's trying to uh, keep the chart afloat. They've been selling their US dollar reserves, so they need more. They need to go and pay their weapons bill to Russia and China, especially Russia, because they've been ordering. Main online apparently likes Russian branded um, uh, military goods much more than he likes the Chinese made in China stuff. So he's going to have to pay that bill. Um, he's, they basically have to have money to pay their soldiers and keep being able to import aviation food, fuel to be able to maintain their airstrikes against civilian population. So this is where we have to hit them. If the big oil companies like Total, Chevron, and Woodside are leaving, we cannot, uh, we have to remember that it will take several months for them to withdraw. And in that interim, they are still um, contract, their contractual obligations to keep paying revenues to the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, which means basically pouring money directly into the open mouth of the junta. And this is where sanctions on Myanmar oil and gas are going to be critical. So, you know, we're looking at the next six months. In the next six months, could precipitate a liquidity crisis for the military. And this is what we need to see happening so that the other military leaders who join the army for economic opportunities, who are already pretty pissed off that the only one who seems to be making money out of the coup is Min Aung Lang and his family members, will start to see that it's not in their interest to allow Min Aung Lang to, maintain, to stay as the leader of the junta. So, you know, what we are looking at is basically pressure um, to inspire a purge of the junta. And if they can get rid of Min Aung Lai, um, who basically dragged the military into this disastrous coup, he dragged the military and the, and the whole country into this disastrous coup in the ultimate expression of masculine toxicity, then um, you know they say, okay, we got to get rid of him and we'll put all the blame on him, then it opens up the space for some type of negotiation. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see Burma on a war footing. So, you know, it's pretty clear. Min Aung Lang wasn't thinking straight, still not. His pride and his ego and his personal interest comes above everything else. And he's not willing to admit that he made a mistake. Um, and he's not willing to step back from the coup. So someone will have to push him out. That's basically the reality. And if, the, and if he's uh, busy trying to fire the, the advocate general and the judge advocate general and uh, uh, replacing the head of the, arm, the air force, then we know he's already feeling insecure within his own junta. There's been too many defections and people not happy with him people losing respect and loyalty to him. So um, we, we need to actually keep hammering on that.
Yes, I I think we are we are having some connection problem here at C Junction at the moment. Uh, but so at some point your image was freezing, but hopefully is now resolved. So I would like to ask the next question. We have the news about a young person uh, self immolating. So what uh, can you tell us about? This seems to have uh, happened yesterday. Well, um, the, it just came up in the news and I think Tenza Shunlei um, uh, shared that um, breaking news um, uh, um, yesterday in one of the forums and it was quite shocking. It's the first time that we we first time since the since in the past year that a young person has self immolated like that and this happened in Chak Padang in Mandalay. Um, uh, I really hope that um, you know it's it's a, a terrible sign that if people feel that the that they've lost hope in the situation and their only means of protest is to kill themselves. I think um, this is uh, just as heartbreaking as the posters and the, um, early on in the coup where a lot of um, older people, a lot of senior citizens were putting up, holding up signs like, you know, kill me so that I can, so that there's enough people killed, are willing to die so that there's enough people killed to um, activate R2P. So, you know, um, uh, it's it's uh, it's tra it's a tragedy, and I I know that even those people who don't know um, this young man personally are also all of us were deeply affected by the news. Um, it's it's tragic when we hear of friends and comrades who've been killed in action, who've been shot dead at protests, who've died in custody, but um, it's also um, um, very gut wrenching when someone actually attempts to kill themselves as part of a protest. And we hope that this is a wake up call for anyone with any compassion in the military junta that they cannot afford to keep killing and causing the deaths of young people, either through direct violence or through this type of oppression that young people feel the only way that they can resist is to self-immolate. It's a, it's, a, it's a very horrific and tragic um, incident. And I, I hope that um, we don't see any more of this. We've seen enough already. I mean, you know, in December, we had two cases where in Sagai, 11 people were burnt to death by the military. And then we had the Christmas uh, in on 9th of December, and then on Christmas Eve, the Christmas massacre in Kayaste, where nearly 40 people were burnt alive, and which the military actually confirmed they did, but, but called them, called those IDPs, those internally displaced men, women, and children, terrorists. Now, in January also, there were more incidents of people being burnt alive by the military. And I, I think um, uh, I don't I don't want to see. I don't want to see any more of those incidents, but it looks like it's a pattern by the military. But I also don't want to see young people um, burning themselves alive um, um, as part of their resistance. Uh, that you know, the, it, it, I, I hope that pe young people see that there is hope and they have something to live for, and that they need to live to be continue resisting and transforming their country and their future. Sorry, Leah, you're uh, muted. Let's bring us to the last uh, two questions for uh, today. Uh, one going back to ASEAN. Uh, yeah, I think many of us are disappointed about the role of ASEAN. Uh, it has also been noticed also by myself that uh, representative of the Junta are participating in the GMS summit and other uh, regional arrangements uh, outside of the public eye. 
uh, even us, we didn't pay much attention to that. So where uh, does this region uh, really aiding, I mean, in, in, in relation to uh, Myanmar, what you see for the next year, uh, if anything, uh, that this region, whether uh, through ASEAN GMS or other uh, commercial interests, what, what will be the positioning? Um, now, of course, the declaration of Nolin Iser is uh, particularly uh, significant also for this region, being, uh, since she come from this region, and uh, some had hoped that maybe that would give uh, somewhat greater understanding of uh, regional dynamics, but maybe it's not uh, going to be the case. Uh, and the second question and final question about what is your uh, hope and vision and, uh, for uh, this next uh, year of the coup? Okay, wow, that's, that's already another one hour of, uh, of answering. <laughs> um, look, um, we don't have very high expectations of ASEAN. I have to say, having worked on human rights and ASEAN responses to threats to human rights, violations of human rights and threats to human security in the region, especially what would be an almost non-existent regional um, uh, response to the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, you just, just sometimes you just wish, you know, I don't expect ASEAN to do too much, but I do expect them to at least, if they can't do anything to fix the problem, just get out of the way. Just move out of the way please and let other people get on with it um and um, um what has been quite interesting is that hun sen basically threw a grenade into asean leadership by his cowboy diplomacy and going off to burma and then you know blithely saying oh the country is very peaceful now they've got all these ceasefire agreements and blah 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 it's like oh this guy he not only not only is he a cowboy, he's doing this reckless, the reckless um, um, diplomacy, but he's actually not done his homework. Now, what that did was it hardened certain parts of ASEAN. So we're seeing now a very clear division between some of the, the different leadership within ASEAN on how to handle this issue. And um, you know the, the 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 first big event to be hosted by Cambodia as a chair, the, re, the ministerial retreat, had to be postponed because most of the guys changed their mind and said, "Oh, sorry, we are busy, we can't come." And that was a very ASEAN way of showing displeasure that Hun Sen had kind of blithely promised Min Aung Lang to invite him because he was the host. Uh, invite Min Aung Lang to this uh, his retreat, and now you know he. Uh, Hun Sen has had to dial back. But what also became quite clear is all these different states then came up with statements emphasizing that there should be no political representation from Myanmar until the five point, until there's been significant progress on the five point consensus. Now, what that means also is having to understand that most of this is focused on the high level meetings. And, um, and ASEAN, uh, anyone who does, who goes to these ASEAN briefings, the first thing that the um, ASEAN representative will tell you is, that, oh, ASEAN has uh, 300 meetings a year. And so then now we're going to have to like say, well, if there's no progress on the five point consensus, we shouldn't just be looking at the summit and the ministerial meetings. We should actually be widening up, as you rightly say, Leah that there has to be greater scrutiny. We can't have a junta representative at AICHA, come on. It's like, um, you know, AICHA is the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on human rights, not on violate, how to violate human rights, but how to promote and defend human rights. So we don't need a junta representative there. And ACWC, the ASEAN Commission on Women and Children, come on. I mean, the women and children's rights are being routinely, routinely violated in Burma. And remember how we talked about this quite chilling pattern where the military seemed to be purposely killing children, children in their homes. And there was an incident, if you go to the coup watch, ASEAN's coup watch that was published just a couple of hours ago, there's an incident in which 
this uh, military went to a house and told all the occupants to come out. And when uh, the 10 year old child of the family came out, they shot him dead and then, you know, dispersed them. So it's like they purposely of all the householders who came out of the house, they targeted the 10 year old kid. And so, you know, like if you have these kinds of incidents, why would you have the perpetrator come to these meetings? So I think um, the challenge now will be to pressure um, kind of, uh, states like Malaysia, Singapore, et cetera, who have actually put their foot down on the political representation to say, look, you, you really have to actually make sure that this is a comprehensive ban, a comprehensive exclusion. And if you can't do that, at the very least, you should invite the NUG representatives into the room as well. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, so I think that's going to be pretty important. What's the hope and ambition? Well, um, we, we want to be able to continue to actively stand in act, not just sit, stand and talk, but also act in solidarity with um, our comrades uh, in the country and in the diaspora. And we see um, friends in the Milti Alliance um, becoming very active on this, and that's been inspiring. We really need, we really need to see the young people in Burma win, because we do need to see friends in the Milk Tea Alliance and Burma, all the young activists, be the next generation of political leaders. If we actually want to see things improve, if you want to see um, this planet survive, not just in terms of human rights, but also environmental justice. We need to have, we need to sustain and support these activists to be the, to the, be the lead, to have their leadership recognized. I'm not saying to be leaders of the future. We need to recognize as, them as leaders for today. And we need to keep feeding the hope and deliver some key, key development, some key progress on Burma and the rest of the region this year so that fewer people will feel that the only way that they can resist is to kill themselves. I think that's so important. If we allow this coup to continue and drag on and a situation of protracted conflict, spiraling conflict to continue in Burma, we lose, we lose a generation of um, leaders to armed conflict. They become hardened fighters and it'll be hard, much harder for us to turn back the clock, to restore um, civilian democratic government in, the, in, in Burma. And if we fail to do that, then the rest of our region is in deep, deep shit because this type of infection, if you don't get rid of it, can spread. And we, that's the last thing we need in Southeast Asia. Well, this is uh, sadly the good words to conclude this episode. But uh, before ending it, I think few uh, few information I think I would like to share. First, thank you to Debbie. She has been with us for eight episodes, and she has shared a lot of insight and wisdom as well as uh, brought some humor even in the most dramatic uh, moments of uh, and of course a lot of passion and animosity and some bad words here and there so for that we are very grateful and we hope to continue to collaborate with her and we will continue in many different levels then for those in bangkok uh, i want to invite again to come to the exhibition that we have currently at the Bangkok Arts and Cultural Center. It's about different art. And you can see the whole year of the coup through artwork, including the episode that uh, Debbie has been talking about of the child that was killed in the arm of the father and also other fallen hero, but also the solidarity of the Milk Tea Alliance, the uselessness of ASEAN and the international community, and the change from very colorful uh, demonstration, artistic 
Celtic music, etc. At the beginning, uh, the Myanmar Spring and the change to the armed uh, struggle towards the middle of uh, of the year, when of course the atrocity also increased. I think you can get a very good perspective of uh, what this one year of the coup has been. And also I want to announce that uh, in keeping what Debbie has said uh, about new generation, the next uh, speaker will be the director of uh, the Researcher Republic, which is a group that has come out recently with a report on energy. It's a new generation of researcher and I am sure uh, that uh, she will be uh, also a very insightful uh, resource for all of us, both from a research experience in the country as well as from her own experience of uh, living in a current state uh, for the last three years. So I am sure she will bring uh, new insight and we will introduce her properly the next episode. And least but not last, we have here also Jen Alassi. Jen, are you here? Or she's maybe not here at the moment, but- Oh, she's uh, here. Jeannie, you better unmute and do a plug. Jeannie, but Jeannie is maybe- <laughs> Hi, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Hi. Uh, okay. Jeannie, because I am going to announce that we will have two uh, movies as part yeah. so, so maybe Jen, Jean uh, can say something about the first one is they are going to be both on LGBT like Debbie mentioned uh, just a few uh, minutes ago uh, about the important role of the LGBT community in this struggle in Myanmar and also recently uh, one transgender woman, actually three transgender women have been arrested and we know the heightened risk of sexual violence for transgender uh, people in prison. And so we are quite worried about air, which we happen to, to know through our work. And uh, so we wanted to dedicate uh, some uh, solidarity again uh, to this transgender and LGBT minority in Myanmar. So two of the film we have chosen as part of the Spring uh, Benefit Festival, uh, which uh, Jenny is uh, co-organizing, and she can tell us more. One of the film is directed by Air. So please, Jenny, can you tell us? Yes, um, we're so delighted um, to have C Junction as one of the partners of the Burma Spring Benefit Film Festival. This is our encore edition. The festival um, was launched last year in response to the initial violence that erupted following the protests against the coup. And it was such an incredible response from the audience. We had over 7,200 people log on to the festival worldwide, ranging from Egypt to Argentina, to Myanmar, to, um, to the UK. And we have a very excellent selection of over 44 films. All of them are about Myanmar. Um, and they, they include both documentaries that are more hard hitting political films, such as the ones that uh, C Junction will show, as well as animation, drama films, short films, including many titles that are created by Burmese filmmakers, which we are very much hoping to support. So Leah's uh, program at C Junction is an excellent curated program, I believe, of choosing two selected films. One of them is called This Kind of Love, and it follows the personal diary of the return of Ang Yo Min, and the founder of the LGBTQ movement in Burma, who is a longtime human rights advocate and colleague of Debbie's upon his return from exile after 24 years. And it delves into his life story and the issues he confronted with human rights upon his return. And uh, C Junction is quite honored that Ang Yo Min, who is currently the Minister of Human Rights, in the national unity government will be speaking following the film. So it's quite a, a, an extraordinary opportunity that C Junction has confirmed him as a speaker. And that will be followed by another really beautifully done uh, film called uh, Irrawaddy Monomore, done by a Burmese filmmaker. Um, and 
again, as Leah really much underlines the continued need for the protection of the LGBTQ community in Burma as protest and violence continues because they did play a vanguard role. So the festival is really very delighted to partner with C Junction on this and we're looking forward to um, the discussion. I'll hopefully be there um, for, for that. Well, please, I'm looking forward to it. Everybody, please uh, keep on supporting all of these events. And um, uh, one final thing for me, you know, 20 years, the military, 20 years ago, military locked up on Sang Suu Kyi and people talked about how a military of uh, Rohunta 400 um, soldiers were afraid of this one lady. Well, since it's the lunar year of the tiger, they locked up on, on Sang Suu Kyi and woke up several million tigers in the form of young activists all around the country. And what the military is doing now is because they fear all these people. And this is why we need to keep on supporting this youthful energy to transform not just Burma, but our region. And thank you, Leah, for having me. Thank you. And uh, so in uh, solidarity, let's say, let's continue to roar, right, in the ear of the tiger. <laughs> bye bye and thank you to everyone. For Take care. See you around. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.